at Riverside. He has his master's from uh, University of California Davis in microbial and eukaryotic genetics and his PhD from the same university in molecular genetics. And then he moved to California, oh sorry, he moved to Australia uh, to work as a research, as a research scientist at Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial research, uh, research Organization in Canberra. And then he drifted back to California and he, and he joined as faculty member at University of California, Riverside in 1990. And he's the director of Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Climate Resilient Copy. Please help me to welcome Dr. Timothy Klaus. So thank, thanks three for the introduction and thanks to the organizers. It's really an honor to be invited to be part of this symposium. And um, you know, I must say that uh, I feel as though I've got more to learn by being here and uh, meeting people and seeing what you have and hearing all these great ideas uh, than I have to share. But um, I'll share what I have to give you context of, of uh, what we're doing now with Calpi. Um, the title is Genetics and Breeding. The flavor is much more about genetics, as you'll see. So <clears throat> we'll just launch right in. Okay, so <clears throat> I've split the talk into several parts, give you a bit of the Calpi context, the relevance of, of what we're doing um, on a broader scale, um, talk about a, a linkage between UC Riverside and Africa that goes back quite some decades, and then move into traits and genetics. Okay, I'll get this eventually. Okay, that'll work. <clears throat> so we think about the human population growth. So uh, here's a chart for the past uh, 50 years or so, and you can see that the, the major increase in the population growth is in developing countries, the light green. Um, and so <clears throat> Sub-Saharan Africa, in fact, where a lot of our, our work is focused, has the world's fastest population growth rate now, and is projected to on out out into 2050. Um, and in addition to that, here's a plot from FAO 2010, food insecurity map. You can see uh, much of Africa is uh, quite hot for food insecurity. So overall, about one third of Africans now are undernourished. So we have a, an issue here with such population growth and such food insecurity. So if we think about the uh, ecological zones of Africa. Um, Kelpi is important in some of the most important uh, in food insecure places. So in this band drawn across the continent of Africa, this is a uh, sub-Saharan zone um, south of the Saharan desert. It's, um, Kelpi is one of the very few crops <clears throat> that can tolerate the um, extensive uh, and the extreme environments of this um, Sahel region below the Sahara, the hot and water limited conditions. So we think also about the size of the problem that's coming. Think about the size of Africa. So Africa is a, a huge continent. It has enough land mass to uh, be equal to the sum total of the USA, Western Europe, China, India, Argentina, and some other things all together. So it's just a lot of people, um, a big issue. So if we look at population projections out to 2050, um, some of this is highlighted. You can just look on the top, for example, Nigeria alone by the year 2050 is uh, projected to have a population growth to get up to about 300 million people, almost the population of current day U.S. And there, there's rapid growth uh, in many other countries in the African continent. So another issue about production of food is that soil productivity is declining in a lot of areas where the food must be grown. Uh, more intensive cereal use is dominated farming, uh, lower fertility, um, people, uh, smallholder farmers generally can't always afford fertilizer. So cowpea fits into the picture there uh, quite well. If 
by putting more legumes into the system, um, it brings more nitrogen into the soil, of course, helps with organic matter. Um, so I've been, I've been uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa the past two years on a couple trips, and what I've, I've seen a lot of uh, the intercropping there. Calpia is very often intercropped with, in the areas where I've been, sorghum and maize, but also with millet. So it's, it fits the agricultural system. So what about cowpea? Uh, some elements of cowpea, <clears throat> big unguiculata. It's native to Africa. Um, the wild populations, to Kintiana, some debate about whether they really, the center diversity is West Africa or South Africa, but um, there is a fair bit of diversity in the, uh, in the uh, broader germplasm from which the cult cultivated varieties have been derived. It's important as a food, as a fodder, uh, as I said, it helps increase nitrogen available in the soil. Um, it's a warm season legume, so it's very closely related to uh, soybean, common bean, pigeon pea, and other vignettes. I'll come back to some of this again. Uh, it's well adapted to water limited environments. So it has, a, by today's standards, a, a relatively small genome size, just 623 megabase, and it's diploid, 11 chromosomes, so 2n equals 22. So again, cowpea in the uh, as a food uh, plant. It's important <clears throat> for forage, so after harvest, it's sold as forage um, for livestock feed. Uh, the grain is very important. We eat black-eyed peas in this country, uh, but many different seed coat patterns are, are, are used and preferred in different uh, cultures within Africa. So. Also, the, the leafy vegetable is, is eaten. Of course, you can't eat all the leafy vegetables if you want pods and seeds, but um, the leafy vegetable is among the most protein-rich of all, of all plant leaves. Um, <clears throat> so it's sold in marketplaces, open markets, locally. It's also exported uh, from countries that can produce in excess. Um, it's sold as a, a fresh grain. So the, the cowpea pods come early in the season and they, they help when um, uh, food supplies are running short. Cowpea leaves and then pods are some of the, the first food during the rainy season, so they help break the hungry, hungry period. And then also, cowpea is important as a, as a source of cash income. You, um, uh, you see people all along the roads who are preparing uh, various things, akara, is produced from a flour made, made of the pulverized cowpea. It's mixed with some spices and, and uh, some salt and cooked in oil and uh, very nutritious uh, as a fast food. So this is a typical fast food uh, operation along the roadside in uh, West Africa. So uh, Riverside has been involved with um, training uh, uh, cowpea Breeders, geneticists for some years, going back now a little over 40 years, the CALPI program was started at UC Riverside by now retired professor Tony Hall. Um, and his emphasis was always genetics and physiology, and then um, from that deriving some uh, breeding strategies. So currently we have a student from, uh, a female student from Senegal, uh, Sassum Lo. Um, we have a, a student from uh, Mozambique, uh, Arsenio and Dev. They're both in PhD programs at UCR. And just yesterday, while I was here, um, we had a, the arrival of a six-month visitor from one of our partners in Ghana, Richard Ajare. Some of them might be online now. If so, hello. Uh, so <clears throat> we have partners currently uh, in, in West Africa and also in an in a equivalent um, agroecological zone in Mozambique. So we have we have partners in uh, Senegal, Ghana, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, and then also Mozambique. So this is um, across uh, or in in a good section of the uh, main cowpea growing areas. These are the leading uh, breeders in these countries, and I'll come to who they are here shortly. So something that we have. Uh, available in Riverside that helps strengthen our partnership is that we're uh, in close proximity to some uh, agricultural fields that help us uh, look at plants under conditions that are somewhat similar to West Africa. So east of Riverside, about uh, 100 miles to the east, is the 
Coachella Valley Agricultural Research Station. And there, if we plant in late August, we're in short enough day length that even um, the, many of the varieties that won't flower under the long days during a California, normal California growing season will flower um, in this Coachella Valley uh, agricultural station. So there it allows us to look at things like uh, we, can control the, we can control the water and look at things like the influence of drought on time to flowering or pod set and, and so on. So it's somewhat of a mimic for West African conditions and that's to our advantage. So before I go too much farther in this uh, talk, I want to acknowledge um, funding sources and people. And so um, in UC Riverside, we have quite a group. Uh, Phil Roberts is on this list. He, he really, I would say, is the leader of the breeding effort and the agronomic activities. We have many others in our group. We have uh, in Nigeria, we're, we're partnered with IATA, leader is Usman Bukhar. Uh, in Burkina Faso, with Enera, the leader now is Joseph Batiano. In uh, Senegal, Isra, leader is Yaga Sise. And in, in Ghana, <coughs> with Zari, centered in Tamale, but also in northern Ghana, uh, in Manga, uh, Francis Kusi is the leader. And um, then I'm going to talk about some things that have to do with sequencing, and there have been various people involved in contributing some sequences. We're funded principally by, by funding sources that support international work. So the Feed the Future program supports two innovation labs at UC Riverside. One's focused on insect resistance, the other on some um, more abiotic stress-related topics. Um, those are associated with USAID. We've had funding uh, with, from Generation Challenge Program before it sunsetted. Still a little bit of funding from CG System. And then NSF has uh, recently um, committed to funding through the NSF Bread Program and a new project that starts on Friday this week. Um, and then we've had some nice support from Illumina helping us um, afford basically uh, through their Agriculture Greater Good Initiative some of their products. So we'll move on into traits and genetics. <clears throat> so as with every crop plant, there's a whole onslaught of um, biological forces that you know, sense that energy that's being accumulated through photosynthesis and something else wants that. So at the seedling stage, the young seedlings can be attacked by aphid. Uh, of course, uh, uh, well, flower, flower thrips later on come in and, and uh, ruin the flowers, ruin the pod set. Pod filling stage, you can get different pod sucking bugs. Um, pod borer comes along, and even the, the dry grains <clears throat> can be attacked by um, brucids or these, these weevils that lay their eggs and the larva penetrate and out emerge the adults. <clears throat> Heat is an issue. Sometimes it's it's especially it can be a big issue during reproductive development, where it can ruin pollen formation and cause lack of pod set. And then drought, the drought predisposed pathogen macrophemina, uh, probably known as charcoal rot of soybean or ashy stem blight, and then others bacteria, viruses, nematodes, and a parasitic weed striga is a big problem in West Africa. So all these are are issues that need to be addressed. Uh, so there is a rich and diverse germplasm. The biggest collection is held in Nigeria, now close to 15,000 accessions. The second biggest is in Griffin, Georgia. And then uh, we have the third biggest collection in Riverside. So <clears throat> some years ago, we, we um, looked at the uh, diversity of, of African land races. And we could see that there are clearly two domesticated gene pools, one in West Africa and one mostly in East Africa, and there's been some intermixing. Um, but so we keep this in mind as we've approached uh, developing tools for genetics. Let's have tools that can uh, are targeted toward the, uh, the whole uh, set of, um, Af of domesticates in Africa. Uh, <clears throat> so I guess in a, I, I wanted to conceptualize you know, genetic, genetic idiotype breeding. So this is a little diagram where, you know, if, if you, I think this is probably not a new concept to most people in this room, but let's say I've, I've illustrated here, let's say you have four different possible parents and you have some background knowledge of different regions of the genome that carry favorable traits. And so the idea would be to build something that has elements of, of each of those four. So most of what we do with cowpea is nowhere near this complicated. Most of what we're doing now in terms of breeding is, is, is just integrating one new favorable trait into a preferred background through back crossing. 
but you could, in principle, become much more complex or even take things to the extreme when people are ready and they're not yet, and say, extrapolate this out and you have genomic selection. So genotype informed decisions. Um, this is how we view things. You know, you, you have an idea, like maybe you have a genetic idiotype, or maybe you just, you just want to breed in striker resistance into a preferred variety. And so you have an idea. So um, genotyping comes into play. You can, uh, of course, you can see what you have, and you can, you can follow the flow of parents' uh, parental material through progeny and make progeny selection. So what, what we have set up with our partners in West Africa is uh, we've, we've developed uh, an Illumina iSelect uh, genotyping assay. And um, so what our partners have been doing so far is we asked them to take their leaf samples of plants that are relevant to their breeding program, put them in a Ziploc bag with a couple of silica gel packs. They'll dry out in three days, but in the mail, you'll get back data. And uh, so DNA is extracted. I put a gel here of uh, a large range of qualities are fine for the iSelect assay. You get data back, looks like this, and a genome studio display, and then that can be exported and put in spreadsheets or something like this. This is a flapjack view. Uh, flapjacks made by uh, James Hutton Institute in, in Scotland. And uh, so you can view and browse around in your phenotype sort and make, make your decisions as to what progeny look right or do you have pure lines, et cetera. So anyway, to do this, of course, crossing is important. You make crosses. and to make these decisions, we're using, we're using knowledge, knowledge that comes from uh, genotyping knowledge. Uh, for genotyping knowledge, you need a genetic map. So we've put quite a bit of effort in, the, in one of the Feed the Future projects into upgrading the genotyping tools and the, um, and the genetic map itself. So we've, we've developed what's called a 60K, um, 60,000 attempted assays on iSelect. It ended up netting roughly uh, a little over 49,000 validated, uh, highly reproducible SNP assays. So from that, we've applied it to several mapping populations. Some are listed here. Five populations are listed here. Uh, number of lines, number of markers, number of marker bins. So we now have a map that we froze in October, which has a little over 37,000 uh, 37, SNPs. Um, uh, it's, it's a got about uh, one bin per one-fourth of a centimorgan, and the largest gap is a little under two centimorgans. So this is a step up that helps us considerably. Um, I just wanted to say a few more things about the iSelect assay. Just we've, uh, We have quite a few mapping populations we've been working with. And um, so if we look at how many SNPs we had on a previous assay, which was a Golden Gate assay, here's the numbers in, in the hundreds. Um, uh, and then we had a map prior to this new map that had 1100, about 1,100 markers on it. Now with the iSelect, the polymorphisms have gone up about 41 fold. So we now have the kind of density where we can hope to get nice uh, uh, marker haplotypes across favorable alleles. And that, that will help that knowledge into the breeding program uh, rather than having gaps and too much spacing. So some other things I want to say about the iSelect assay. Uh, it requires very little DNA, only about 200 nanogram. Uh, there's, as I put up in a slide, high tolerance of degraded DNA. It doesn't matter if the DNA is intact or not, just that it's clean. Um, the SNP data production can be in a matter of days. Our fastest turnaround with a, a service provider that we use is about a week and a half. Um, oftentimes it takes longer than that, but it can be, can be quick. Uh, so you can potentially be looking at uh, potential uh, uh, cross parents. And so you can potentially sample at a young seedling stage and get data back and make your decisions before flowering, or at least before flowering is finished. The turnaround time is, is OK. It's quite good. Um, very low missing data with the iSelect, typically less than 1%. Compact data, about a quarter of a uh, gigabyte for 288, 288 samples, so it's easy to transmit it and uh, quick analysis. Uh, there's a software genome studio that makes it easy to go in and reevaluate the data calls if you need to. Uh, it's very easy to train users. You don't need programming skills. You don't need uh, large 
you don't need large hard drives. You don't need you don't need a um, system administrator. You don't need a RAID. Uh, anyway, so it's it's convenient. It's more expensive than some other methods, but there's a lot of convenience, and that's an important factor for now when we're trying to upgrade the use of markers with our, our breeding partners. Uh, you get the same SNPs every time, and there's very few other cost components. So back to uh, Calpe. So Calpe is in the um, subfamily Papillionoidae, uh, the tribe Phaseoli, along, along with other warm season legumes. And when we, when we take that, that uh, new um, genetic map that we have and uh, take this, the sequences of the surrounding sequences of SNPs and use BLAST to compare to other legumes, here's a synteny diagram showing the relationship between cowpea and common bean. So what we see here around the, um, the right uh, half of the diagram are the uh, linkage groups from cowpea. And um, on the left are the pseudomolecules of common bean. And you can see a very extensive synteny drawn between them here with this circos diagram. So even six of the cowpea linkage groups are essentially collinear with common bean. So this is great. This, this is, uh, really bodes well for reciprocity of information gain across legumes, these two diploids especially, I think. Um, though we do see extensive synteny with with uh, soybean, of course, but you know soybeans a bit more complicated, being uh, more like a tetraploid. So, <clears throat> and then five linkage groups have fairly simple relationships. Generally, a, a history of probably um, some breakage and fusion that, in general, is probably is uh, two chromosomes. Um, uh, you know, one one cowpea linkage group or one cowpea chromosome may have have an ancestry of the equivalent of two parts of uh, phaseolus chromosomes. So anyway, we need some common numbering between the two and look forward to unifying the numbering a bit because that also helps people communicate and compare readily. So there's a one that's been chosen as a, a genome model by Mike Timko in 2008, and we've continued on with that. Uh, IAT African breeding parent, it's, it's resistant to some races of parasitic weed striga that are important in West Africa, and that's partly why it was chosen. We um, uh, initiated our work with it as a reference genome by taking it through single seed descent several times to establish purity. And it's been verified 100% homozygous using the seed stocks that we have, which are available to people who might want to use their imagination to do something. We have about, we produced about 200,000 seed um, last year, uh, hoping that uh, a, a colleague will take on making a tilling mutant population. Anyway, so it's a black eye. And uh, that's the reference genome model. So there is some uh, a draft genome sequence that has been available from our work for some years based on whole genome shotgun sequencing to about 65x coverage with one long insert library, throwing in uh, Mike Timko's gene-rich uh, Sanger sequences generated some years ago and some back-end sequences. And so together we had about half of the uh, genome accounted for uh, not counting the ends in the in the scaffolds, and the fifty percent more if you count if you count the padding, but um, a fairly good uh, draft sequence in terms of uh, supporting things like PCR primer design, and it also supported the SNP discovery that we went through for the iSelect, and it has been supporting some GBS work through the hands mainly of Sharon Mitchell at Cornell University. So even with this rough sequence, which is highly fragmented, um, it does contain about apparently at least 97% of all available of, of cowpea genes based on it containing that percentage of uh, known transcripts. Um, and also it has uh, a lot of, contains uh, uh, orthologs of uh, more than 90% of Phaseolus vulgaris predicted genes. So it's a reasonably good uh, draft genome sequence for this, but we're fortunate with a new NSF bread grant that starts Friday. The very first objective in it is to elevate the, the genome sequence up to a, um, a much higher quality by adding long read sequencing and bio nano, nano optical mapping. And um, I, I guess I should say that we, we went ahead and took a jump start on that, and I'm, I'm 
surprised pleasantly it comes very quickly the using these new methodologies so we, we also have a Calpe physical map that was produced some years ago through Ming Cheng Lo's hands supported by uh, the GCP so again the same African breeding parent a couple of back libraries fingerprinting and assembly so the maps online and the, the idea here is that in putting together the map it, it fed into sequencing we sequenced, um, we tried to sequence the whole minimal tiling path of the physical map and um, only ended up getting about 60% of it. But the idea was using what we had available, whole genome shotgun back sequencing. The idea is that if you have a trait mapped and you'd like to know what gene is in there for developing more markers, or maybe you have the, the opportunity to develop basic research to understand exactly what gene underlies a trait or reach into germplasm diversity and, and uh, find alleles. Uh, that associate with a favorable trait that way. Um, the idea was that you can zoom in and find a region and, and uh, even without a whole uh, first-rate genome sequence, you can dig in and find within a region a list of genes that are present that are, are your candidates. So let's talk about um, implementing some of this work. So start with what, do, what have we actually been doing with our partners? Um, we've been doing I guess a lot of what I sometimes refer to as uh, janitorial work. So in our own program at UC Riverside, we have a small breeding program for California, and also with our partners, there's been an accumulation over years of things that aren't exactly what, what you think they are, and I guess this is probably typical of, of most breeding programs. But with genotyping, you can see what you have. So one question was to just to get from all of our four partners in West Africa, we asked them to uh, send samples of all of their most important breeding materials. And we'll just take a look at them genetically and assess them. And so one assessment that we made is shown here. Um, I select genotyping. And so we um, received samples from our four West African partners, ran through genotype, ran through uh, principal component analysis. And here's a little display in the curly whirly software. It's also made by James Hutton Institute. So there's a few points that um, I've highlighted here. Uh, there, the spots are colorized based on the, the source of the material. And so we can see examples within breeding programs like that circled here in green of very similar uh, materials that, have, uh, that are very similar genetically but have different names, not surprising. Um, also, some cases where things have the same name or nearly the same name, but they're genetically quite distinct, and there's, there's some surprises in that. Um, and then what we can see is there's different amounts of diversity in the different breeding programs. So the purple dots here are the Ghana breeding program, and you can see that it, it, doesn't, ha it doesn't have the diversity that the other three programs have. And this may be, maybe we would track it down to the you know, greater influence of B.B. Singh, who was a the lead breeder in West Africa for about 20 years. Maybe he had more influence on the programs in uh, Senegal, Burkina, and Nigeria than in Ghana. But anyway, there's, there's less diversity in the Ghana program. So this helps define some strategies about sharing materials and expanding germplasm uh, base that's used in the program. So there's another thing, what we often see, I brought up the point of sometimes you see things that have the same name, but they're different. So I just made a little illustration. Oftentimes, what you see looks like this. Um, there are haplotype blocks that distinguish one isolate from another, and it's easy to explain this. If a variety is declared, let's say at F5, it's only four generations after the F1, so you've got one half of the fourth power, one sixteenth of the heterozygosity still there in, in an individual that's declared the variety, and then that, as it inbreeds, you you. Uh, create a mixture of seeds that are not identical, they track back to the, that heterozygote. This is not uncommon, but it's really important to know what, what you have. So what we're going through now is for each, for each variety that's important, we're trying to define which one people are going to use as the, the reference seed stock and establish that and distribute it throughout the partners. So it's a cleanup process. There's another cleanup uh, uh, we found looking through these real, real populations that had been developed over a number of years, we found um, quite a few rogues, um, so outcrosses, you know, that had gone unknown, unknown without genotyping, and then uh, individuals that are identical to each other. 
And so these things foul up QTL mapping. So here's just a little illustration. Um, so here's a little illustration contrasting Mitch Lucas, a former student, prepared this. Uh, so the solid line is a QTL plot um, when you include rogues in a mapping population. And then the, the dotted line is one where you've, you've taken the rogues out. And so you see sharpening of the QTL peaks. And um, so it's quite important to get those out for the mapping. This is all cleanup activities um, and important to, to the programs. So we've gone through and mapped quite a few cowpea traits over the years. Some years ago, we prepared this uh, golden gate assay and we applied that for mapping. So we have a, a list of traits now that have been mapped. Most of these have publications associated with them from aphid resistance on down the list to uh, uh, some fairly loose yield QTL, um, but you can look down the list. So I'll pull up some examples. So this is an example I want to run through from a former graduate student, Marty Podorf. Uh, so Fusarium, for example, Fusarium D disease resistance, her first publication was on Fusarium race three. Um, so here's some phenotypes, wilting and stunting, chlorosis, and uh, leaf drop and vascular decoloration. So she went through the process that I think you're familiar with. She had a real population, did her scoring, uh, used the phenotype and genotype to get QTL peaks, and um, identified one major predominant QTL peak, and of course, several minor. And um, so then she made an alignment of, the, uh, of that region of, of the uh, genetic map with individuals in our population and, and with other materials that had been available through the uh, UCR cowpea breeding effort, materials that were known resistant and known sensitive to uh, that race of fusarium. So she made an alignment, was able to narrow the, the region uh, down to just a centimorgan or so. And so like this. And at the time we had established these, um, uh, the back physical map and we had done a fair bit of back sequencing, and so she was able to find that her flanking markers were within a single back, so she sequenced that, and she was able to uh, also use a little software tool that we have that we call Harvest, where in, within this we have a Synteny viewer. So um, she could see Synteny on soybean we were using at the time. So here's her, she's Hermes 3 resistance locus and looked and found two regions of synteny and soybean, and then from that uh, could pull out a list of candidate genes in that, in that soybean region. And uh, then when this was compared to the back sequences, she found that the uh, cowpea back sequences contained some of these, including some of these um, resistance gene analogs. So her hypothesis was that uh, one, one of those uh, resistance gene analogs in the back clone that sequences the trait determinant. So we can get that far. Um, is there some abiotic stress-related uh, target traits in the Feed the Future effort? Um, <clears throat> so Macrophamina phaseolina is one of them. Uh, so drought, drought stress plants are very prone to infection and gain, uh, have the disease from this pathogen, which is a real problem. Uh, for one reason, because uh, the breeding programs in West Africa are tending to try to develop varieties that uh, develop earlier, and there's quite a bit of correlation between um, earliness and macrophomena sensitivity. So it needs to be dissected out. Uh, we need to be able to identify the parts of macrophomena resistance or broad tolerance that can be brought into the plants that are uh, separate from uh, probably separate from earliness. So <clears throat> uh, heat sensitivity is another one um, for some, uh, some of the uh, hotter and drier regions. They, they will have difficulty uh, in uh, producing pollen if the nighttime temperatures are consistently above about 30 degrees, but especially in, in the experimental work done by Mitch Lucas, he used 34 degrees as a as a, um, uh, a stressful treatment. At, at 34 degree nighttime temperature, the, the pollen doesn't finish developing, and so then you you um, 
uh, get pod abortion, no, no seed set, no fertilization, and pods abort. So it's, it's a reproductive heat tolerance, and that's relevant. Mitch uh, Lucas published some work along, using the same path that I just described for Marty. So here, one of his uh, heat tolerance QTLs, you can see lines up through Centony Viewer, and you can pick the region of, uh, of common bean here that it aligns with. And uh, so again, a candidate gene list. And again, that's as far as we can get right now with Calpew. We, we, we can only get as far as, as finding candidate genes because there is not yet uh, a facile transformation system for Calpew. And uh, so it would be lovely if there was, and I, there will be someday. Someone will do it. Maybe someone sitting in this room will, will make things simpler. So macrofamina resistance, we have some progress on mapping some resistance components. So here's an example from a field of a very sensitive line and a very tolerant line. And uh, so have some uh, QTLs mapped for macrofamina resistance. Map, you know, just here's a sampling of some other traits that we've mapped and published. So uh, foliar thrips resistance, uh, um, leaf shape, and, uh, and seed size, so various traits. So I want to pick out one, especially to go through a little bit more. So aphid resistance. So um, in screening different sources in the California Central Valley, it was found some years ago that this African uh, elite IT97K-556-6 was resistant to the prevalent biotype of aphid in, in the California Central Valley. So um, here's uh, a resistant plot and here's one that's sensitive, just coated with aphids. Uh, there's the culprit. So the QTL mapping of, of a population, a California variety by which is aphid sensitive to this African parent, uh, produced one very strong QTL on one linkage group and a minor but significant QTL on another. And so this has been brought into the California breeding program, which right now is really a, quite a small program. It's in, so I'll just go through an example that I think probably most of you are familiar with. So I'm, it's just a little animation of what I mean by introgression. So uh, what we have done in our California program is to integrate this aphid resistance in, into the CB27 and, and other preferred California backgrounds. So that's just an illustration of aphid resistance. So you've got a donor and a current variety, and then make a cross, make an F1, let recombination occur, uh, back cross and um, <clears throat> of F1 to a current variety genotype, find those that have uh, the maximum amount of the recurrent parent and the, the allele that's being brought in, use that, back, let it recombine, back cross again, go through the cycle genotyping, back cross and self-pollinate and, and uh, so on. And so what we've seen is that, uh, and maybe you know this already, but with the markers we've seen that we can count on getting 80% and upward of the gain back toward the recurrent parent per generation with populations of about 100 individuals. So that's kind of a little, a little rule of thumb. And after, after three back crosses, it's uh, you know, quite likely that you're back to a, the recurrent parent with just inter, a small intergress segment. So they're, in the California program, these um, intergress lines with aphid resistance have been bulked up and, and uh, they were out in the field last year uh, in Central Valley and they'll be out again. The question is, uh, most of the California growers want to use one variety called CB46 and the question is really, if you have this one, can you see any difference? If you have this one that has this little bit of aphid resistance built into it, uh, can you see any difference between this and CB46? And if the answer is no, then, it, then it's a winner. It's as simple as that. So. Another material that we've been developing that I want to say something about is we've developed this um, multi-parent advanced generation intercross population with the following the strategy of Kavanaugh et al. So it took eight elite varieties and went through a series of uh, intercrosses and then inbreeding to establish recombinant inbred lines. So um, started the first crosses in 2010, but uh, in 2015 we finished off um, 
getting uh, F8 derived F10 bulks from nearly all of them. There's a few stragglers because some of these parents, two of the parents are short day requiring, so they, they, um, we can't push three generations through per year, uh, only two with those. Um, but so some have fallen behind a little bit. But anyway, so now we have this, uh, this magic population, almost the whole thing out to F8 derived F10. All of them have been genotyped at the F8 stage. And I'll come to some results of that. We've got um, the Calpe magic parents are listed here, different sources, uh, you, California variety, very, various produced at IATA uh, in Nigeria. They represent different diversity groups on a little phylogenetic tree of, of cultivated uh, cowpea. And um, so each of these was chosen also because of its phenotypes. Each one tested uh, as high yield under drought in at least one of our partner environments. And, and there's a whole bolus of favorable traits, heat tolerance, stragger resistance, and other traits mixed in here. So there's quite a bit of variety here in photo period, uh, response, time to maturity, pod load, growth habit, uh, seed coat colors, flower colors, leaf shape, um, many traits, seed size. Uh, so taking the SNP genotyping data and running it through using um, GWAS, um, using GWAS program from, from TASSEL. GWAS works because the relationship of all the individuals in the population is the same, so it's you know, one, one uh, group of, of kins. Uh, so anyway, two big peaks came out for fusarium resistance, and they coincide with what was published previously, um, so it, it works well. Another, there's a seed size QTL. It matches one of the major QTLs that was found in Mitch Lucas' work, which I illustrated briefly on seed size, seed size QTL from South Africa. And then sepal color, here's uh, LOD scores up, up above 100. Um, sepal color is one that's very easy to score. It's basically a presence absence trait. So the magic population has within it uh, the mapping power to map quite a few traits. So it's a couple more things that I wanted to say if I had time, and maybe I do. So one thing that we're, we're uh, getting across to our, our partners is that um, our partners in West Africa, of course, uh, you know, there are many meetings where they hear a lot about markers and high throughput and, uh, you know, volume, voluminous marker and genomic selection. And these are, these are um, uh, all great things to, to be involved with and to strive for. But one question we say is you have to really think about the expense of genotyping. And a basic question is, can genotyping answer your question that you have biologically? What's the minimum density that you need? What method will meet your requirements? It has to have, has to have at least the minimum genotyping density. The sample preparation has to be compatible with their laboratories. We're now getting them used to the idea of making their own DNA uh, from pulverized material. Data production has to be compatible with their laboratory. Um, the laboratories often have, you know, power outages, like six power outages per day, and maybe power is out completely two days, so you want to be able to use a laptop computer. Um, <clears throat> not even on internet access, they usually don't have reliable internet access even when the power is on. Uh, data understand have to be understandable by their personnel, and of course it has to be affordable. Affordable's a key that currently everything is highly subsidized by grants, so we're spending way more on genotyping, for example, than it's sustainable. But it's a transition period of learning about genotyping where it comes into play. So the other thing we said is uh, genotyping decision path. Um, think about what your materials are. What do you want to find out? How can genotyping provide the answer? And so it, um, the the answer of what genotyping platform to use really depends on your starting material. So if you're if you're going to do GWAS, you want a lot of markers. Early back cross generations, you want a lot of markers, and there are options. Uh, as you get farther into your back cross generations, you don't need so many markers. You can use something like um, KBio, which is LGC for outsource, or multiplex PCR, maybe the, the most cost effective of all eventually. Um, late back cross, you may just need a few markers maybe even just gel-based markers. All of our partners have been taught to use gel-based markers through the efforts of the Kirkhouse Trust, which is an organization supported by um, Ed Southern, 
and they so they're quite accustomed to using gel-based marker systems and most of them keep asking us if the SNP markers can be converted to gel-based. So, so this is the this is the context that we're working in. These these breeding operations are small operations in West Africa and uh, the goals really in terms of breeding are mostly right now about integrating single favorable alleles into preferred backgrounds and bringing markers in the picture. So I've got some closing points. So uh, cowpea is a critical food crop in sub-Saharan Africa, relevant warm season legume. And so the research on cowpea that we do and that I think practically anyone would do is closely related to food security. So the impact potential is high. That also makes it attractive for funding, at least in the last decade. The Gates Foundation and USAID have been very interested. NSF is now more interested. Uh, Calpia has a rich germplasm diversity, I've mentioned. Um, it's, it, well, you all work with plants. You know that the diversity is always interesting subject matter for teaching. So Calpia is easy to cross. You can grow it indoors uh, year-round, outdoors during warm to hot weather. It's a diploid. You can cross it easily. It tends to inbreed, so you can have it either way, inbreed or outcross. Um, simple genetic system. So, you know, potentially it could be advocated as a new model plant, maybe a new model legume. Um, it, what it really lacks is uh, it doesn't have a good mutant collection. There are a few people around who are very interested in making tilling mutant populations, and, you know, we would encourage that. It doesn't have a facile transformation system. Others are, are working on that. Um, <clears throat> so there's substantial genome resources, SNPs, maps, mapping populations, draft genome sequence. Uh, a new one, a much better one, should be ready and out uh, before the end of 2016. Um, a lot of traits have been mapped. There's a lot of opportunities for map-based cloning, mechanistic study, and I think um, a lot a lot there with cowpea that could be fodder for new careers. So that's where I want to end and um, take questions. Could you describe a little bit about the biology of cowpea? The reason why I'm asking is you mentioned for your reference genotype that it was completely inbred. Yeah. And I'm just curious because you know, I, I only think of that happening with double haploids because it would be hard to self out all of the residual heterozygosity. So I'm curious as to presumably cowpea must be very highly self out. Usually. So that IT97K-499-35 had a history of single descent before it was sent to us. But um, and uh, there are, like with most varieties, there are different uh, collection, there are different um, stocks of the, under that same name in different locations. And when we've looked at them, they're all different from each other. So, but not very different. So like about uh, IATA and Ghana each have things that are different from UCR. They're, they're, they're each about 3% different. And so I don't know, I don't know how many generations of inbreeding there were before it was declared um, a, a, a variety, but it must, I would guess it must have been at least out to F5 or F6. And so when we received it, we went through three more generations of selfing, single seed descent, and then SNP genotype. And back then with Golden Gate assay, it was homozygous everywhere. And we run it back through iSelect, it's homozygous everywhere. So the heterozygosity is lost. Yeah, cowpea usually inbreeds, but um, it is insect pollinated. And if you have you know heavy pollinators, you can get 30% outcrosses. And, um, but in a greenhouse, uh, you don't have to bag it; it'll it'll sell. You know, the only time it won't is if there's collision of plants or something like that. So some mechanical 
disruption of the flowers. How many markers did you say you had in your art select? Well, there's there's a almost fifty thousand good ones that work well. Yeah. Yeah, Jim. So I think you're you're pointing out that the the magic population is not a panacea in terms of germplasm diversity. It has only eight parents, and they they are selected based on prior phylogenetic knowledge to be eight different parts of the of the cultivated cowpea germplasm. But so we also um, under the Feed the Future um, uh, Innovation Lab for Climate Resilient Cowpea, we also are have reanalyzed. Um, prior knowledge of different core collections of cowpea and, and uh, defined a new core. Uh, and so we've, we've been growing out about 400 of them that are more diverse core. And so those will, those will go out back out in the field in Riverside for observation um, and Coachella Valley later in the summer for observation. And, uh, and then those are, well, most of them have been genotyped now. The rest are at the core facility. And so we'll look through those and, and um, try to do some association of, of, uh, of traits with, with genotypes and hopefully have enough density to find uh, additional favorable haplotypes. And so those would reach far outside of the, the magic. So, um, you know, the future, the future, I think, should be one where everything that's not just purely a duplicate that's in the cowpea germplasm collection, which is if you add up everybody's collections and look for the, the union set, it's probably only about 20,000 accessions, maybe less, because there may be more duplicates. And with the way things are going with the sequencing, um, you know, it's, it's important for food security. I think one could make an argument that you just do whole genome shotgun sequencing of everything and uh, create that repository of knowledge along with seed stocks that are uh, matching the, the genetic information. So um, th that was one, you had a different question. Searching for rare alleles. Maybe what I said encompasses that a bit. We're looking, if we look for, if we have 400 uh, accessions going through the GWAS analysis, then if an allele is, you know, a, a few, for 400, then maybe we'll find it. If you have any questions, you can close that, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Close.